Hey -o, and welcome back to the Yup 5108 microcontroller series. Today we're going to be talking about the system clock, what it does, why we need it, and how controlling it with a few extra logic gates are going to greatly assist us when it comes to software debugging and performance tuning. So ready or not, let's get on into it. Today we are talking about the system clock, which is this small portion of the circuit. So since we're going to concentrate on just this, and we'll need to look at the ROM as well, I've grayed out the area portions of the circuit that aren't as interesting. So as you know, electrons are fast, but they are not instant. And so input values that change from 0 to 1 take some time to cascade through a circuit, and in the interim, however short that may be, the output value will be in flux and not valid. So to prevent the use of not yet valid outputs, most digital electronic systems, including microprocessors, use a system clock pulse that goes from 0 to 1 to 0 on a clean square wave uh, at a very specific frequency. So to visualize that, let's take a look at the system clock uh, provided by Logisim. And as you can see, if we click on it, we go from 0 to 1 back to zero, and then we can also have it auto-click with control K. So now it's pulsing back and forth once a second, nice clean square wave, and a value that we enter. So notice we only recognize the pulse if its change happens, happens to intersect one of the transitions in the square wave, either the up transition or the down transition. And that way, any spurious signal that comes and goes in between clock steps is ignored, and the system is kept in sync. So, much like a metronome is used to keep time for musicians, the system clock in a digital system uh, ensures the synchronization of both when the output values can be safely read, and when the input values are brought into the system from the other direction. Almost all computers, tablets, cell phones, they're at least partially rated on the speed of their system clock. This desktop here is a three gigahertz or three billions of cycles per second. Um, your cell phone might be one to two gigahertz. Uh, an Arduino or other Internet of Things processors typically run much slower and it's usually to save power. And they run somewhere in the 16 to 48 megahertz or millions of times per second. But in the 80s, the high-end 8-bit microprocessors and microcontrollers that our, the Yup 5108 is designed after would typically run around 1 megahertz, and often you would run them at half that, about 500,000 times a second, or 500 kilohertz, uh, mostly to save power and to extend the life of the chip. The Yup 5108 Logisim simulation, this simulation over here, running on my 3 gigahertz desktop, simulating all the internal signals manages to achieve a mere six to nine hundred ticks per second on average and sometimes it's a little faster sometimes it's a little slower it's just fast enough to look like a 1980s console the 5108 emulation that i've written in c plus plus while not completely cycle accurate uh, uses the same instructions and roms it runs at about a speed of up to 66 megahertz and one of the future things I want to do is port the C++ emulation to Java so that I can create an object, a uh, Yup5108 Logisim object that I can drop directly into the simulation and attach I.O. to and work with it from there, but it'd be a hell of a lot faster than having to simulate all of these internal signals. What we have is a system clock here that we can toggle on and off or have auto run and in this case we're trying to run it as fast as possible and right now it's getting in the 425 range so not terribly fast and as you can see the code is sort of going around in a circle here this is actually waiting for input from the user I just happen to know that because I'm familiar with what this address is as far as functionality now we can start and stop the clock we can auto run the clock and that gives us some ability to stop and see what's going on in the system at a particular time. But one of the things we're going to want to do is stop the clock from code. If we look back over at our 
assembly uh, layout, the instruction for halt is um, 1, 1. So if we replace an instruction with the halt instruction, like say for example, let's go, let's go to 0 in the ROM, and you'll see the first two bytes, 0, 0, 0, 1, that's the address in Little Indian of the first instruction we're going to execute. So now if we reset the system, we could single step using F9 all the way through the sequence until we manage to load. You don't see a lot going on just yet. That's all the clearing. Now we load the address and then we load that instruction. And you can kind of see it here through the gray. And so you might say, well, luckily we had this counter going, and so that told us it took six, 17 clock cycles to get from reset to the first instruction in our program. That'll tell us basically what our boot up time is. So seven clock cycles at whatever your speed of your clock is. So in this case, we were single stepping, it's very slow. If it's running at uh, a thousand times a second, then that's seventeen thousandths of a second it took for your system to get to the first instruction and boot. Very fast, it's what you want for an embedded system. Now you might say, well what is that instruction doing? It's a 76 instruction, so let's go take a look at that real quick in our assembly. Row 7, column 6 is the LDR instruction, or load into the DR register the next two bytes in Little Indian. So what that says is 76 says load 0, 1, and 1F into the DR register, which is where our data is pointing. We then use instruction 96, uh, which, let's take a look at that, is the long call function. So basically what we're doing is we're setting up the DR register to say what we want to print, and then we're going to call the function to actually make the print. So we might want to say, well, how many clock cycles does it take to print that first string, which in our case is the um, boot banner string. So what we can do is we can actually replace this instruction with a 1-1, or halt instruction, and then tell it to auto run all the way until it gets there. So there we go, we reached our 1-1 halt instruction. Our clock signal that is originally is still going, but it's not getting to the rest of the system because it's being blocked by this symbol, which is referred to as a logic gate. In this case, it's an AND gate. So let's take a quick look at what an AND gate does. This is an AND gate. In this case, it's a two input AND gate with one output. So what is an AND gate? Well, or a logic gate in general. A logic gate is a way to uh, combine signals together in different ways. In this case, we're combining them with the AND function, and the AND function says that the output is only going to be 1 if A and B are 1. And since there's two inputs, there's four possible states that the inputs can be in. A0, B1, a1, B0, A1, B1, 0, 0, the starting point. So when you take all of those possible inputs and you put them in this sort of table form, this is referred to as a truth table. So if it's 0, 0 inputs, we get 0 out. It's only when we have 1 and 1 inputs do we get 1 out, and that bears out in the usage testing here. So what's happening in this circuit is we actually have a, a three input AND gate. And what that's doing is it's saying if this signal here is low, then whatever happens to the clock signal doesn't matter. It's not going in. Now this other signal here, you might say, well, that signal looks low as well. And it is. But this circle here on the gate is an indicator of what we refer to as an inverter. An inverter, or sometimes referred to as a NOT gate, is one that simply changes the input value from uh, 
its original to the, its opposite. So if the input is zero, the output is one. And as you can see down here, it's a very short truth table. So what's happening every time you see a little circle on the input to one of the gates, it's actually doing a little inversion right before. So while this looks like it's off externally, and it is, the inversion, what the gate sees, is the inversion of that off. And so it sees a one there, it sees a one zero one zero one zero on this input, but this input is low, and because of that, it never reaches a state where all three inputs are on at the same time. And that cuts off the clock signal from the rest of the circuitry. What is this thing here uh, that is changed from zero to one? This is called a flip-flop, or a one-bit memory storage device. And it stores its setting of either zero or one, and toggles, in this case it's a flip-flop that toggles, so every time there's a one on the T input and the clock signal changes, then this would toggle from zero to one. Um, however, because the clock signal and the toggle signal are, are, are bound together, and right now they're both one, uh, the signal stays one because we don't actually get a clock changing. And this isn't tied into the main system clock, it's tied into the output of this other logic gate. And you'll note this other logic gate is a little bit funny shaped. That's because it's an OR gate. And as you can imagine, an OR gate has two inputs, one output, and the output is one anytime one or the other of A or B are one. So if one is if A is 1, then the output is 1. If B is 1, the output is 1. And if both A and B are 1, the output is 1. Again, here's the truth table for the OR gate. And what we're doing actually with that OR gate is we're, we want to be able to turn off the clock signal using the internal signal of reaching a 1-1 one, one instruction. But at the same time, we also want to be able to turn off the clock signal if we get an external signal here from this stop input. Normally you're not able to see where your uh, instruction pointer and what bytes it's pointing at are. Normally that's not visible to you until you stop the system. So what we wanted to do is have an external way to stop the system clock, much like we had internally using the 1-1 instruction, this external signal this is currently zero, it comes in, it goes into the OR gate. If it goes to one, then this flip-flop is toggled from zero to one. Toggling from zero to one takes away this one and turns this output to zero. That output being zero stops this AND gate from transmitting the clock signal forward. So we'll see that here all happen in an instant. Three, two, one, stop, and there you go. And that lets us stop and then start figuring out what's going on in our system by looking at our registers and, and other things that are going on. If we take this back to zero, then we our flip-flop remembers that we're at one and the signal continues to be blocked. If, however, we pulse the stop line again, we toggle the flip-flop back to zero, that re-enables the AND gate and allows the clock signal to pass on through. I don't think I've fully explained the flip-flop, so let's take a look at that here in the close-up box. So here's our flip-flop. And as you can see, in this case, it's a D flip-flop, which is, means to say a data flip-flop. In other words, anytime the signal changes here, uh, we're going to register whatever the value is in the data and that's going to be our internal value. I used a toggle flip-flop in the circuit itself, the T here, so that I could use that separate signal to just stop and then restart the, the um, circuit as part of my debugging process. But back over here. So in this case, you'll see that the flip-flop has a, a couple extra connections we're not really using. There's a reset connection that just sets everything back to where it used to be, uh, which in general, with the flip-flop, its Q is low and the invert of Q is high. You'll note the circle here to indicate that this is the Q output, but inverted. Now the set signal immediately sets 
the flip-flop to one regardless of the con of the clock signal and that has some utility in some circuits I'm not using it over here you see it's not connected but I do connect to the reset circuit so that as when I reset the whole system everything gets back to its original starting state so if we see there's zero here data let's turn that to one so now we have a one sitting on the D input but it's not going to change until the clock signal goes from 0 to 1. You'll note that it doesn't change when it goes from 1 to 0, and that's because this particular flip-flop is triggered on the rising edge of the clock only. Uh, same thing is true with the counter over here. So let's take a look at that counter. I'll go ahead and reset. Stop the clock and reset. And you'll see if I manually uh, pulse the clock you'll see the count goes up when the clock goes from 0 to 1 but when the clock goes from 1 back to 0 we still have a 1 and again you'll see this little angle bracket here on the clock signal into this counter uh, that indicates that it's a rising edge clock signal so again up to 1 that's a 2 we come down it doesn't make a change go up again there's three and that's why when you hit the F9 button you'll see that this signal goes up to one and then back to zero very quickly. In my debugging I'll often put in space in the program at the start of a function. I'll put in space for either a no, a no operation zero zero which doesn't cause any harm it just burns a little clock cycle time um, but then that gives me space in the program to come in later and replace that with zero zero with a one one then when I get to the beginning of the function I can then single step and debug through the function so we'll, we can show you an example of that here if alright so I've gone ahead and modified the program so that there's a space for a halt instruction and that is located at one zero one zero was the original address made it 100F so let's change this from a no operation to a halt instruction reset our system run at full speed it prints out the banner and sure enough we're at our 11 instruction now we're, that's not really the interesting instruction clearly the 4C and so on these instructions down here that we were repeating earlier are the ones of actual interest but now that we've gotten to this halt, I can go ahead and stop the auto clock. And then we can start single stepping. Oh, stop the auto clock. Can't quite single step because we still have this set to zero. This input is still zero. So we can clear that. Now our sig clock signal gets through and you can see it already auto incremented to the next instruction. So from there, we can actually single step and see what's happening to our registers. 4C is LB0, which is load into B from port 0, which in our case is the keyboard port. Then we're going to do 82. Jump short if not 0. So that's where we check for 0. The next instruction isn't 1.5. The next, that's the destination of the jump. So the jump is not taken. Then we get to 80 which is just jump short uh, regardless of anything else going on and it's going to jump short back to 10 so when you jump short all we're doing is jumping this low byte so wherever we're at now we'll jump to an offset of 10 which is this 4c so we just sit in that tight loop read from the port if the port is non-zero, then we're going to jump to an offset of 1.5. Otherwise, we're going to jump immediately back to 10. So that's how your, your while loop basically works. So one last thing. As we automatically run all the way up to that halt instruction, the 1.1, one, one, uh, sometimes we don't want that to actually halt anymore. We want to go on from that to let it run but we don't have access to changing these individual bytes it's certainly easy in the simulation a little bit more time consuming on the target itself so what we have up in this circuit is the output from the sequence uh, sequencer this line is the one that is being triggered by this one one 
So that's one. And as you can see, if we go back to reset, you see it's no longer on. And it goes on when we hit the 11 or the one month. What we can do with this is we can actually, because that's coming into an AND gate here, we can basically cut off that signal by using this no halt. Flipping the no halt switch or alternatively signaling the, uh, turning off the go switch here for an external use, either one will make this AND gate, this three input AND gate, always have one input as zero and therefore the output will always remain zero regardless of the output from the sequencer. So if we reset, flip the no halt switch, now when we finally get around to that 11, you'll see we actually skipped past it and we moved on. Now if I turn this back on, when we get to the next halt instruction we will halt. And that's all controlled through this additional AND gate which is an input to this OR gate. And the inputs from one gate to the next, each step of an input from one gate to the next is going to take some amount of time. And hence the speed of these gates has to be faster than your clock cycle. And due to limitations on the speed of electronics, your clock cycle is limited on how fast it can go. Most of the advances in speed of computing in the last 20 years have happened because they've gotten the size of the electronics smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And by doing that, the length of the wire between each item is smaller and smaller and takes less time to travel. So the electronics got faster, mostly because they got smaller. And that's pretty much what I have for the system clock video. I uh, hope you like it. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe and all that kind of fun stuff. And we'll see you next time.